Um, cool. So I want to understand closed orbits on Hamiltonian systems using symplectic geometry. This is a hard question, and it requires hard machinery. And about 30 years ago, Andreas Fleur came up with some hardcore algebraic machinery. He wanted to translate this question about closed orbits into algebra. So his approach was to define a chain complex generated by periodic orbits. So for every periodic orbit, uh, you get an extra copy of C into your chain complex. If you take the homology of this complex, you get a ring. And clearly, this ring contains information about your dynamical system. For example, if it's non-vanishing, um, our system has a closed orbit somewhere. Um, obviously, there's a kind of sticky wicket with this approach, which is that we want to be able to determine this ring without knowledge of the underlying dynamical orbit. Um, and Fleur had some really great insights into how to do this that we might touch on later. Uh, but I want to fast forward many years to talk about the gadgets I'm interested in. And I'm really interested in this word somewhere. I want to not only know that my system has a closed orbit, I want to be able to find where they are. So for example, I want to be able to ask uh, if I have a constant energy set. Do I have a closed orbit on my constant energy set? And there is a FLIR type invariant that lets me study this question. It's called Rabinovitz FLIR homology. Uh, so if my constant energy set is a hypersurface, if it satisfies some technical, con technical conditions, like it's something called contact type, I can assign a FLIR type theory to sigma, and this hopefully gives me information about the dynamics on sigma. Um, OK, so let's talk about the example I'm interested in, which is uh, this blow up of phase space at the origin. So what I've done, especially in this picture, I've just taken a copy of C2, I've removed the origin, and I've glued back in a two-sphere. And I can do this in the symplectic category. If you want to visualize it, uh, there's a map from this blow up to this polytope. It takes my glued in two-sphere to this uh, solid diagonal line, uh, it takes the radius 1, 3 sphere in C2 to this dash diagonal line, and all of the other radius 3 spheres are parallel lines. Uh, and so if I take my energy function to be radially dependent, each of these 3 spheres is a constant energy hypersurface. And I can say, OK, what are the dynamics? Uh, it turns out this is pretty boring. It's well known these three spheres are just foliated by periodic orbits, much the way these key rings fill up three-dimensional space. OK, so this is not so good. But of course, if I understand my dynamical system, I can hope to get another paper by just perturbing my dynamical system. <laughs> so for example, I might ask if I have an object moving on my hypersurface and it experiences a finite time perturbation, does it eventually return to its original trajectory? This is called a leafwise intersection point. And an amazing thing is that these algebraic invariants I was studying for my original system actually detect these perturbations. So Peter Albers proved a few years ago that if the rabinovitz fleur homology of my hypersurface is non-vanishing. I always have a leafwise intersection point, no matter what perturbation I used. OK, so this is a really nice story. It's the kind of question I'm interested in. What, what dynamical information can I squeeze out of these kind of well-known, powerful invariants uh, that Fleur came up with? And in my last seven minutes, I want to talk about something that I don't understand. Um, so as I said before, one of the main problems with these invariants is they're, they're difficult to compute. You can hope to relate them to the topology of the underlying manifold. You can hope to use some tricks, maybe some um, spectral sequences if you're really inclined in that direction. But they're hard to compute. Um, and in the past, I guess, 20, more than 20 years, there's been a 
field of mathematics that seems to come up with a really good way of computing these invariants. And this is called mirror symmetry. So mirror symmetry for me is a bit like a crystal ball. It tells me what my theorems should say or will say, but it, it doesn't tell me how or when I'm going to prove them. <laughs> um, so I just want to show what kind of insight mirror symmetry can give me. Um, if we go back to this example I'm interested in, I actually computed the rabinovitz fleur homology of these uh, spheres a year or two ago, and I found that it vanishes everywhere. Um, so this is, this is not so useful. This invariant doesn't really tell me much. And after talking with my advisor and some number theorists, I found out that I'd been working over the wrong field. I was working over C. There's, there shouldn't be nothing wrong with C. Um, but somehow, the, the number theorist told me, ah, no, I know what you should do. You should work over something called the Novikov field, which is this kind of crazy set of kind of so like half of the Laurent series. So I allow uh, exponents to go to positive infinity and not negative infinity. Um, this is kind of baffling, but it turns out that if I work over this field, my crystal ball of mirror symmetry tells me some interesting things. Um, so here's my black box. OK. Mirror symmetry tells me that, bizarrely, I should be able to relate my hypersurface to a subset of this vector space equipped with some function. Mirror symmetry tells me that there's some kind of important submanifolds called non-displaceable Lagrangians in my hypersurface, potentially. And these correspond to critical values of this function. So mirror symmetry is telling me I should think of these kind of interesting submanifolds as critical values. And finally, mirror symmetry tells me that I should think of my Fleur theory as being the ring of functions on my critical locus. OK, so this, this is actually a bit baffling to me, but let's see what it tells me. It tells me that, well, on this side, if w has critical points, this thing is non-trivial. And the mirror statement is that if my hypersurface contains a non-displaceable Lagrangian, then my Fleur theory is non-trivial. So mirror symmetry tells me that Fleur theories, these theories, built to detect dynamics should detect these non-displaceable Lagrangian submanifolds as well. Um, OK, so let's just see what happens when we work over lambda. So in this example, it, it turns out there's kind of one non-displaceable Lagrangian, and it is the fiber over this point sitting in the radius 1 sphere. Um, and I had this result over C that said that my Fleur theory vanished everywhere. But if I follow the intuition of the number theorists and I work over lambda in some non-trivial way, I actually get a Fleur theory that detects this Lagrangian. I get a Fleur theory that picks out this radius 1 sphere bundle and tells me there's something interesting happening on it. Um, so this is basically all I want to say, I want to pause and just kind of gape at this because I started with some very complicated dynamical systems and I made some very complicated algebraic invariants. And at the end of the day, my crystal ball of mirror symmetry told me that all I needed to understand were the zeros of some analytic function. Um, so this is just, this is something I want to understand more. I want to know how is mirror symmetry telling me about these algebraic invariants? What is it telling me geometrically? I have this algebraic invariant that is really picking out a special hypersurface for me, but what is it telling me? What about the dynamics is it telling me? What about the geometry is it telling me? Um, and finally, mirror symmetry is usually expressed globally. This is, this is somehow telling me something local. And so I want to know, how do I understand Fleur theory and mirror symmetry in a, in a local fashion? OK.